Hey, how's it going? I made it. I survived. I was thinking if I, you know, if I managed to get pick up COVID on the flight here, I was wondering if I could continue doing Patreon while I had COVID. You know, just kind of looking ahead. I think uh, Chris Cuomo did that. I believe if he can do it, I can do it, right? Um, good stuff. You know, I'm excited because yesterday I didn't play at all. I was flying all day. And I picked up a guitar today and I immediately had like three or four new ideas. I love that about the guitar. I just, it's incredible. You know how long I've been playing that thing? And there's still stuff to do. Uh, anyway, this new place is going to be great. I'm going to be able to set up um, an amp here. Hoping to get to that maybe tomorrow. It's a little noisy here because it's on an urban street. But, um, but with an amp, that shouldn't be a problem. And um, yeah, I think it's gonna be good. Oh, um, there's this one thing I found today that it possibly could be a really good exercise for developing muscle memory. I wanna test that out for a while before I lay it on you. But, um, but you know, I mean, I have to, I get kind of excited about these things I find and then a couple days later it just sort of fizzles out. Could be one of those, but it might not be. And if it isn't, it's cool. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, Aaron's asking whether I could talk a bit about my inspiration to revise and expand Improvisers OS. Did the first edition of the book leave me, or possibly students, feeling a bit unsatisfied? Hell no, Aaron! Who could possibly be unsatisfied with that book? Seriously, just between you and me. Or was it more of a desire to document additional ideas in writing that you've been developing since the first version was completed? More of that, uh, you know, not saying there couldn't be dissatisfactions with the thing. I didn't have any, but I, sh I know for sure people could, because they always do when we make stuff. Uh, but no, it started in the most mundane way. I was talking to the guy that helps me, at the label that distributes my stuff. And uh, we were running out of the book, you know, a, pr a printing of the book, which is no big deal because we print small numbers, but it was time to reprint. And he said he's like a, he's a, a software guy. He's a kind of coding genius. Um, among, you know, being a label magnet. It's uh, G-N-A-T-E. Um, but... Uh, he was saying that when a new book on Java comes out, which is once a year, there's some updated book on Java, the guy who writes the main, you know, the Mick Goodrick of Java literature, um, writes a, an update of his Bible for Java that includes like a chapter at the end with new um, information in it that's been gathered during the year, right? And he said, people continue to buy the same book that they've owned various other volumes of for that chapter. So he said, why don't you do something like that, you know, before we repress it? And, um, you know, I thought, well, maybe it's not a bad idea, because there certainly have been stuff that had come up since the first one was published, which was, I think, 2004. So that's a good long time. You know, that's 15 years, right? So yeah, stuff had come up that I wouldn't mind writing about, but, but it just seemed lame as I began kind of, you know, gathering ideas for it. It seemed kind of lame to just throw another chapter at the end, Java style. And I quickly realized that to do this, it would have to be a complete rewrite. I just felt like that would be the way to do it. And so I kind of poured through the book, the old one, gathered the information that I thought was essential, which was a lot of it. I mean, it was pretty pared down initially. There wasn't a lot of filler. It was actually no intentional filler in the thing. But, you know, some of the writing was a little um, obscure, like it didn't seem as clear as it might be. Um, so in that sense, I did use questions that students had about the book. I tried to factor those in to how I describe the stuff. But I mean, man, there's what, one thing, aside here, one thing I realize is that no matter how, as I've talked about before, no matter how, how clear we think we're making something, people, you know, it's not like people pour over with a microscope. I mean, some people do, but some people just kind of read it casually. So, so you know, a question like, um, 
So are formulas important or something? Which is actually a good question. Let me think of one that kind of indicates a cursory reading. So should I use patterns with this, for example, you know, with the formulas? That's a question I've heard. And the book is like all about how not to do that. So I mean, I'm not saying there's validity in, it, validity in every question. I think there is, actually, to, to be found in every question. But what I'm saying is, it's not like people really, you know, grok. That's right. Every, every sentiment in, in the book, you know what I mean? So there's always, no matter how clear you try to make it, is what I'm saying, it can still be um, misunderstood, or you know, the info can be passed over anyway. Um, so there was that element, trying to make it clearer, to add the newer stuff, and just to kind of feel like it wasn't just a, hey, everybody, I wrote one more chapter, pay for it again. You know, I didn't want to do that. So I essentially rewrote the entire thing. I mean, I kept some paragraphs that I thought were, I couldn't make them any better. I just couldn't, you know. I, I tried, but I couldn't. So some of that's in the book, but most of it isn't. Most of it's really a new way of saying some of the same stuff, a lot of the same stuff, but with 15 years more uh, exploration described. So uh, that, all right? I, I stand by it. I think it's an improvement. Um, I mean, I, I think it lost a little something in terms of just the first one was a little leaner and meaner, and this one is a little bit more, it's a little softer. It's a little less hard edge. Like I was really trying to, in the first one, it was really that kind of antagonistic relationship between the teacher and student, which kind of drove the whole thing, I thought. And this is the biggest difference. And in the second one, the teacher is a little bit more, um, you know, tolerant and loving, if I can say that word, of the student. Not, there's not quite as much uh, acerbic uh, conflict. <laughs> in the thing. But I think it's cool. I don't think it loses much from that. Adam says, he's talking, Adam's talking about math rock. Math rock. Which honestly, I sort of know what it implies, but it's not like I really know what that is. Is it like fusion, rock fusion? It seems like it. Um, as opposed to jazz rock fusion. Do you agree? And he's, Adam's asks, do you agree a song labeled as math rock renders its emotional content irrelevant? I mean, I think labeling any music as an idiom does that. I don't think math rock does it more than anything else. Um, you know, maybe math rock implies something that potentially distances more people because most people don't like math, or they're not good at it, or both, or they don't like it because they're not good at it. So if you say it's math rock and somebody's not good at math, like that immediately <laughs> makes it a little less attractive. Just like jazz fusion. I mean, to me, there's no, there's no name of an idiom less interesting, less enticing than that, you know. Um, so I think that can happen with anything. Um, because, you know, I mean, I think what the artist is trying to do, unless they're trying not to do this, so, the goal of many artists is not to simply fulfill the requirements of a certain idiom. I mean, some people, you know, create like that. I'm going to write a jazz piece now, or I'm going to paint an impressionistic painting. You know, some people think that way. And that's what they, they're trying to evoke, that's what they're trying to get across, and if they can do that successfully, mission accomplished. But I think many people don't feel that way. I certainly don't. I mean, I use these common grooves of rock and funk, you know, just ground level stuff. Um, but it's not like I'm trying to evoke either one of those things. So, and it disturbs me when somebody does call it that, um, because I feel like they're not really seeing it. You know, they, they've, I have this theory about it. I think that when people perceive art, it's, art is an invasion. It invades us. It invades our, our, our sense, our senses when we take it in. And that can be scary. And not everybody's down for that. Not everybody's down to be invaded with no, no barriers up. Some people are. Like, some people are really open to that. Because they know there's, there's so much juice out there that they, can, that they can use to enrich themselves. They don't want to block themselves from it. But I would say most of us, Really, even people that are open 
have a certain amount of defensiveness built to protect ourselves from our and, um, and one way to do that, the, the easiest way, the main way that people do it, is to try to define it. They try to put a word on it. So by doing so, they become its master. They then own it. They put it in that box. Oh yeah, that's jazz. Boink. And they're safe. They don't have to really be exposed to what it might really be, which isn't something so easily defined as jazz, maybe. I'm just, you know, for example, what I came from. So... Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's why people always do that. That's why when you know when the when the cab driver says, "What kind of music do you guys play?" I, I'm always really hesitant to answer it because anything I say is going to diminish his or her ability to ultimately dig the thing on on the, on its own terms, which is all I want. That's all I want from the listener. Uh, Tim says, would it be possible to request your Mars video? I need some inspiration for the tempo of the song. I don't think I have a Mars video, Tim. I don't think I ever made one. Oh, I know what you, maybe you're referring to the time I played it. No idea if I can. That's a hard song. Can I even play it? Should I make a Mars video? Tempo of the song? To bats, you know. This is a little slow, but... Yes, it's a little slow. Here's where I would play it with the band, maybe. Um, maybe here. ukulele. She was in the ukulele for a while. And um, did she come up with it? I guess I did. I was playing it one day, digging it a lot. And that bo da do da ba da do da bo do da da ba da do came up. That's how it started. Uh, in fact, it used to be called Mars Uke, but now it's just called Mars. And, uh, and then that led to the song. It's funny though, I'm remembering now, I played it once, a, a bass player subbed on the gig once, who shall remain nameless, and um, I'm for no particular reason, he's a really good bass player, but this thing came up where there's a bass melody, like it plays through the first, the first time through that verse, the bass is just kind of playing, that thing. But, and then the second time through the verse, the bass doubles part of the, mel not the melody, but the sub-melody, which is one, two. That's that thing. And, and it's a little weird, like the way the harmony works. The melody is, is diatonic to whatever the harmony is, but, you know, it's a little, it's a little, mind stretchy it's not it doesn't sound like a major scale it sounds like and the guy was like i think these notes are wrong <laughs> you know you no know, it's supposed to be like that you know? so some people hear stuff some people don't you know it was wrong for him uh tyson says he didn't mind the blurry videos well yeah i mean you certainly got your fill i think of the 150 plus, the 160, I think, that I've made. I think there's a fair amount of blurry in there. But he, Tyson says the lo-fi high content makes for a nice alternative. 
Lo-Fi High Content was on the cover of uh, your Basic Live because it was so low. It's the most lo-fi record I've ever made. It was recorded, I think, on a Sony Walkman. I'm pretty sure. Hang on! And, uh, and yeah, so I, I hear you, and I'm sure that this one may fulfill the requirement, Tyson. I don't know, because it's a new, new uh, locale. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'll end up splitting the difference. You know, if you intentionally made blurry videos, then you have to figure out how to make sense of that in terms of, of the making of it somehow. It would have to have something behind it for it to be anything other than accidental. But thank you very much for your tolerance. You say it makes a nice alternative to a lot of what is available. Yeah, like everything. I've never seen any Steve Vai videos that were out of focus. Have you? It's a nice, you know, you gotta make a statement, right? That's my thing. Anyway, thank you. I am acclimating. I will return, hopefully with an amp soon, tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I can get it together for that. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you for your, your wishes and, uh, and input, as always. See you tomorrow.